perhaps a little bit of a personal, or maybe too personal uh, background and where I come from and why we decided to embark in this journey of establishing an organization that was going to help us reach uh, and achieve our mission, which is work with women and help them to, to get involved in conservation and protect their wildlife. That is screaming for help. And as you know, we are... Oh, that's you. Wait, okay. So, that's me. Okay, you're not perfect because this is my part of the presentation, so you... <laughs>
finish my education and I always remember that she would tell me, it's please go to study. The study is the only thing that you will take you from these situations. And I did it. Very proud. I said I finished civil engineering in university. And I got pregnant of my beautiful daughter when, when I was 20. In my final year of my career, it was hard, obviously, but it was, it was also a blessing. Shortly after, I, I was working uh, in, as an engineer and I didn't have any idea of conservation or species extinction because it was very little spoken in my country. And I was um, introduced to the world of conservation and bird conservation especially. I must say that something clicked and happened internally in my heart. And I related to these species that were facing such a big challenges and very few people were attempting to do a lot of uh, work that required to protect them. So I embarked in a journey and decided to change my career. So I put down my helmet and I put on a pair of binoculars and I started to learn. And this bird is responsible for falling in love with nature and birds. I'm really bad at remembering names. I'm terrible, I should be better, but all what I know is that I love seeing them in the wild and I always have somebody who is reminding me how they are called, so I'm okay. <laughs> That's fine. This, he, and I remember it. Name is the yellow ear parrot. This parrot is a critical, a critical and dangerous species of parrot in Colombia. When I was introduced to, to him and the story of this bird, there were only 81 birds remaining in the wild. They're literally going to go extinct. I was fortunate to be um, working with a very dynamic group of biologists and uh, uh, researchers who started to work on the bird and identify the threats of this bird. So there were two major threats. First, habitat lost that were affecting them. And, and the second was uh, this bird is such a charismatic bird and they come, they're, they're always curious about humans and they're friendly, they're beautiful. Well, they were being hunted for sport and they were going down. Added to a tradition that is a Catholic tradition, is in the, the, this um, Palm Sunday in their procession. The palm where they roost, it was uh, destroyed and cut just for one procession every year. So when we had identified the threats, we are starting to plan what were the solutions and what we needed to do as fast as possible because we were again erasing against extinction. So we worked relentless with several groups and we did um, environmental education campaigns we started to put artificial nest, nest boxing, boxes. We did a huge approach with the church, and obviously they called us Satan. We were the devil because we were trying to destroy a century tradition. But eventually, year after years of talking to them and explaining, they opened their hearts. And, and I remember one day going and speaking, and Say, wait a minute. If God created everything as the Bible says, right, why are you not protecting one of God's creation and is this beautiful bird? I think that might resonate with them. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> and they're not going to call me. And anyway, they got on board. They are the bishop. Uh, in one of the masses, and we're talking about 
thousands of people, maybe even millions of people, because that is the Catholicism is the religion of in Colombia. But at the time, he announced that he to the congregation that from that day on, uh, another pond was going to be used and invite everyone to participate. So that was amazing, and the local authorities uh, joined us and banned the use of works pond. And all of these plants working with researchers and working with the community help us to bring uh, the, the power to uh, more than 2,600 individuals today. This work wasn't done just with one group. It had to include many, many. But what I saw when I was leading this organization and this work in, uh, in Colombia is that women would have, were not involved in many of the activities and there was this neglection towards them. There was a lot of opportunities for men and even the kids received environmental education and they were in the festivals, they were, they were in, in the programs. And women were not. And that was when I thought about what my mom was doing and how could I start helping women to get involved. And I had this idea to create a program that was called Women for Conservation under the umbrella of the organization called Proavis that I was leading and directing. They couldn't say no because I was the boss. Right? <laughs> so, good. And that's why we need women in leadership positions because you have the power and you have the, the respect uh, and from people that say, okay, maybe this is something to consider. But anyways, coming back to the story, we started to create these, these uh, groups of women and get involved in a different ways and especially receiving training and having access to information and developing skills. It was amazing. It was incredible to see the transformation of these women who they thought they were nothing or they couldn't, they couldn't contribute at all because sometimes in in their own minds, that's what they see, right? And, but it's, it's a lie. I think it's, it's a lie because society many, many times doesn't allow women to thrive and everything is difficult and complicated, especially in these areas when it's very hard to have childcare or you don't have even money to go from one point to another point and they are fully responsible for the bring, you know, to bring up the children. We combined the two things, conservation and women empowerment, and it was amazing. Until I hit a wall that we wanted to do more. We wanted to have more women and more young girls included. And that was when I started talking about family planning, because we saw that these women were getting pregnant at early ages, and the first thing that happened is that they couldn't go and study or pursue their education. So we started to do those that initiative, and I had a lot of rejection, and I decided to establish an, an, an organization. If you have a problem, you find a solution, right? And get a little bit of courage and support from really good friends that believe in you, and we established a non-profit organization. And when I was doing all this work, my little girl, Isabella, here, she was little, she was four or five in that top picture, and she started to learn from me everything about nature, and I was taking my daughter two species projects and I ended up doing exactly the same thing that my mom was teaching me when she took me to visit the project. And now she is uh, an amazing woman and conservationist and a biologist and also an artist. So my message here is we as women have an incredible power to influence others and our own family and our own daughters. And I see here in, 
in the in the in the public, in the, uh, a mother and a daughter there, and that's just remind me, and it's so wonderful to share this story of my daughter here with me. And if we can allow these women all over the world, because I think, uh, especially in developing countries, allow them and help them to have, have, have access to training, to opportunities, they immediately pass on to their children. And what a beautiful story if we can replicate and replicate everywhere this and facilitate. So that's the work that we are doing. And uh, this is another example of the artistic component. Isabel is very artistic, and you might think, oh, the mother, she maybe is like that too. Well, I know I can really dance, I'm very good at drawing or painting, but she is the better, uh, a better version of me, which is amazing. And we including all of this in our, our approach. Uh, before I, I pass the floor to Isabella, uh, this is, I want to share uh, our holistic approach. Working with women, it must be holistic, because um, women are and for me, we are incredible. We have so many angles and so many parts of our lives, and we need to try to understand different areas. And conservation can be done in just one, it's not one straight bullet. It's different aspects and different areas. So the first area that we focus obviously is nature conservation. The second one, we very, uh, supported of family planning because what I explained to you this uh, providing this alternative for women earlier uh, helps them to decide when to have children and how many and they can continue with, with their careers. And the third is economic economical so economic solutions. It's, it's so important that women have access to to money and they can be independent and they can also be in control of that area. So for in my experience of about 20 years of doing this work, I came to summarize that these three areas are very important and that we should have it included in all of the work that we do. So next one, I'm going to let Isabella talk and at the end I believe we're gonna have some time for questions. I will be happy to answer any other questions I might Isabella, tell you more about our projects and where and how we do it in more detail. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, as you can see, I have very strong women in my family and a very strong upbringing, and we have gotten tremendously far despite every setback and all of the difficulties and for that I'm so grateful to have such a strong mother. And also I'm so grateful to be Colombian. I'm so proud to be from my country. Colombia is mega, mega biodiverse and it is one of the most important countries for plants and animals. It has 10% of the world's biodiversity which is incredible, and it's number one in bird species with almost 2,000 species, and every, every day almost we're finding new possibilities and new species based on genetic data. So we work in 10 sites, in 11 sites, actually there's one site missing here, but in these sites we work primarily with bird species, but of course, work with all different kinds of species as well. It's just birds are an incredible indicator species that can tell us about the health of the ecosystems and how we can detect these different changes based on scientific data, which is updated quite frequently with birds um, more so than other taxa. So we work primarily in these different regions in the central uh, Eastern, Western, and Andes, as well as in the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, top number nine, and the bottom with Tipiqui, which is uh, close to the Chocó and Nariño, and also in the Amazon Basin, where the jaguar is and where the harpy eagle is. 
So this is one of my favorite species. This is the glass frog. And this species is found close to where I actually live and work full time. So I live in the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, which is the most biodiverse area in Colombia. And this frog species is very, very curious. You can see its organs, it's beautiful, especially when it's got eggs. <laughs> So it's very easy to find in the bromeliads, which are epiphytes, which are some plants that climb up the trees and, and seek light. And it's a very beautiful way to be able to, to feel the forest at night, especially in the El Dorado Reserve, which is where I live. You can hear the frogs constantly. And, and then you look and you find these beautiful little gems because they look like little emeralds. And number one, bird biodiversity. So I have the great honor as well to say that I have a hummingbird species named after me, which is a critically endangered and endemic species of hummingbird, only found in the mountains of Cauca, which is um, where I was born as well. So this species, this is a different species of bird, but um, it's a beautiful uh, little piece of uh, video that we've got from Many of our different forest guards are able to film and to register and monitor different species. And uh, this is one of the products of that. As well as mammal biodiversity, which is wonderful. These pumas, this puma was seen at the Cerulean Warbler Reserve in Santander. We also work in Nepal. We have chosen to work in Nepal because Unlike Africa and other countries, Nepal has very little support and doesn't have um, a large ecotourism industry yet, and it's little known, not very explored. Now there's starting to pop up and be more um, activity, and we're seeing more bird guides. But we're also seeing a vast majority of ethnic groups um, that are being kind of cut out from different communities and they have a caste system which is a bit different to our society here but the caste system really shuns a lot of women's group and lower caste so we work with these different groups by teaching them trades with sewing machines and we are able to give them sustainable um, livelihoods trainings and then they can continue and they can start their own businesses, which is wonderful. As well as safari groups, um, we transport safari groups out to different um, parts of the Shitwa National Park where you can see snow leopards and black rhinos and tigers, and these are individuals, these are children who have never seen this kind of wildlife, though they live there because it's expensive and you have to obviously be transported. So nature conservation has many different phases, and nature conservation isn't just a large nature reserve and then leaving that plot, that plot of land alone. Conservation has a lot to do with community outreach and education around the buffer zone of the reserve. So one of the main, main um, activities that we try to focus on is environmental education with the young groups of children in the schools, but also with individuals and women. Um, one thing that we have seen is that the nature guiding industry in Colombia is male dominated, so we want more women to train as guides and forest guards to become part of conservation jobs and a green economy. And of course, reforestation is very important in many areas that have been very, very badly affected by timber harvest, cattle ranching. For example, we acquired recently um, a, about 65 acres of land that was going to be completely divided and partly destroyed by a, a road that was going to go straight down the middle of it. And basically threatened, threatened one of the last remaining plots of land for an endangered species of frog. Sustainable livelihoods, like I was saying with Nepal, is very important to be able to give women autonomy. And this is essential, especially in different areas where 
in Colombia, for example, there aren't as many job opportunities. There isn't a large cosmopolitan area. It's very inaccessible. There is less access to, to signals or roads. And so you can imagine that having a career is, is difficult. And we're talking about women who are illiterate or who have had very little training, um, basically third to fifth grade education who have had to abandon their studies because of having children or because of being displaced by war. Um, in Colombia, many a large population of, of people have been displaced. So one really wonderful story is Fanny, which is in the top right corner of the screen, um, and she's holding the binoculars. I was able to train her to become a forest guard. Uh, I trained her for two weeks. She was illiterate completely, and by the time that we finished um, this last six months of training, now she has learn many bird names in English and Spanish and Latin and so I'm very very proud of her for being able to do this as well as passing on these very important lessons to her children because she has two children and that's what we have definitely seen is that when you train a woman you are essentially training her children as well because she is going to teach them everything and they are like a sponge and they just take up all of the information of their mother. So another thing that we have done is the artisan jewelry workshops, which you can ask Jody to model for you, our yeah. wonderful necklace. Yeah. This is a, a necklace from the Choco bioregion, which is on the Pacific coast of Colombia. It's a beautiful necklace made by the Embera Catillo indigenous groups. These indigenous groups are actually still in a very difficult situation. Um, the women are, this population has been subjected, is subjected still to female um, genital mutilation and there's definitely a still very strong culture. But we work with the women in ways that we can. We don't pretend to try to change culture or step in in some way that isn't appropriate. But one way that we can help them is by helping them their micro businesses, which is their necklaces. They live in very inaccessible areas. Just to get to this community is like 10, 12 hours and terrible roads, so no one's gonna go shopping there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is how we help them. And also the cooking and class, the cooking classes and certifications is really interesting. It's a very um, active way to help these women that are in different areas that want to do home-based um, tourism. It's called homestay tourism where backpackers or individuals come and visit them and camp at their, their little farms or they come in and stay there. And many of the women have actually come to us because they have no prior training. They, they have no idea how to make vegetarian food, let alone vegan food. So, so we've trained them how to make different dishes as well as really getting the techniques from chefs to be able to make beautiful, typical, traditional Colombian dishes so that they can then sell this and create their own restaurants and hostels and businesses that are, of course, sustainable. And one of the most important parts of what we do, and one of the strongest pillars, I would say, which, by a little bit of context, is what has been asked for us directly to essentially to support women with this because women have come up to us and said please please I have a daughter she's 14 she's already she has already had a, da a daughter and she can't study and if she continues like this she'll have three or four or five or six children and family planning in Colombia is not as easy as it is to get here in the United States which you can go to a clinic 10 minutes away in your car comfortably or etc. In Colombia, many women have to walk seven hours to get to the closest road and a doctor's visit she could wait two to three months to get and at that point, well, she could get pregnant. And women, girls are getting married at 13 or 14 at that age and they, have, they are getting pregnant because there's such a machismo or sexist society that men don't have to use a condom if they don't want to. So women have absolutely, well they have a say, but the thing is there's this culture that prohibits them from really taking that control.
control. So what we want to do is we want to talk to them and put that power in their hands and that decision and also give them access to to very important individuals, professionals, psychologists. Many of these women have this is the first time they've ever gotten a mammogram. We teach them with the nurses how to do self-checking and cancer screens, which are very important, which they have never received. I've talked to 45-year-old women that have never, ever received a mammogram until we have come to do these trains with them. And this is to give you a little bit more context of one of the areas that we work with in Sonal and Nera, Colombia, Caribbean coast, close to where I live and work in the Sierra Nevada. This is part of the Sierra Nevada. Um, this is a region which is very, very hit with extreme poverty. And by extreme poverty, it means that you're eating less than one meal a day, or one meal every other day, and the average for a month's wage is $54. So you can imagine, $54 is about 159,000 pesos. So out of those, that money to go to a doctor and do all of these different things could cost more than 50,000 pesos. Are you willing to give up that much? It's seen as a luxury at that point to be able to afford this kind of procedure. So we really cut everything down and bring the individuals to the community that can help them in these screens as well as to implement the implants if women don't even have um, health insurance. And so we cover absolutely all of the costs. And this is something that is wonderful. And the woman, the girl here in this picture is not, she barely turned 15. So it's a very impactful thing that to see in person. And I honestly, like, it really brings me to tears many times because I'm dealing with young girls that have big dreams, but of course they're in these situations that are very difficult. And one thing that I would like to say is that the reason why there's so much difficulty in the coast is because there's been so much displacement from civil war. So basically in the Caribbean coast, many families that have had generations, past generations, pieces of land passed down to them have been told with gun points at their head that they have to leave in the next 10 minutes or they will all be murdered. And so these, these girls come from these families with them themselves have been displaced and have to go to the, to the nearest town. And so that's something that we've seen in Sonoma Nanera and Huaca Mayal. And these pictures of these, these girls in the classroom, um, it's really impactful because a lot of them are also are, are Venezuelan immigrants who have walked hours after hours and days after days to get to a, a better situation. So we all have to act as a collective and as human beings and look at our neighbor and really care for our neighbor and love thy neighbor. And I would like to introduce to you our wonderful leading communications team member. She's a wonderful individual who was able to come to Colombia and, and see firsthand and she's an incredible writer. Uh, 
Um, so she had already been through so much trauma, and uh, she spoke to me about how uh, now that she has the implant, she can just continue her studies and not have to worry about going through an experience like that again, or worry about getting pregnant. Um, and then the girl on the top left, Andres, um, she has two kids already. She's 19 years old. Um, and she talked about how she got pregnant when she was 15, and she dropped out of school because she was too embarrassed to go to school um, when she was pregnant. Um, when we asked her how this implant was going to change her life, um, she said that as soon as her two children got of age to go to school, um, then she would be able to continue her education. Um, she wants to study to be a designer. But um, it just goes to show that like, if we had not been there to like, provide these implants, like, she might have just kept having babies. Like, she's only 19 years old and he has two. Um, so this makes a huge impact on all these girls' lives and, and all the girls that we work with. Um, I also wanted to add that, um, unfortunately, worldwide, um, the, the main uh, cause of death for girls aged 15 to 19 um, is uh, pregnancy and complications of pregnancy. Um, and this community like didn't even have a health clinic. We were um, the, the nurses were meeting with these girls in uh, a bedroom of someone who volunteered their house. Um, but that's, this is just kind of situation that they were living in. Um, this is Kelly. Uh, she is our field coordinator. She's an amazing woman. Um, I think that uh, she hadn't been able to finish school either, um, but she is just like a powerhouse. She just gets things done. Um, she woke up at, at 2 in the morning this day that we went out to the Zona Bananera, and, um, and we, we had to drive to the city, pick up nurses, and drive them all the way out to this rural area to, to treat these girls. Um, but she had talked to me about part of the reason why she's so invested in doing this work and why she's making so many sacrifices to bring nurses to this community. Um, and it's partly because in this region of Zona Bananera, um, it's all banana monocrops. Um, everywhere you see is just fields and fields of banana trees. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the water is diverted into those um, banana monocrops, and there isn't uh, very much, like, there's a scarcity of clean drinking water. So this is a community that has extreme poverty, it has um, a lack of drinkable water, a um, lack of food, and for her, like, she just uh, is so impacted by the fact that girls are being like have no choice but to bring children into this this situation when they when they don't have the resources to support them. Um, so being able to give them that choice has been something that's been really important to Kelly. Um, so this is the bedroom where the nurses were uh, seeing the girls. Um, so there was like everyone was waiting in the in the back. Uh, backyard, and there was like chickens running around, there was toddlers running around, everyone brought their, their, their children. Um, but uh, it only cost $150 for us to provide uh, contraceptive implants for a girl for five years, um, and it can just dramatically change her life. Uh, it's also something that uh, once, like this was our, our first brigade in this community, but we were able to give 72 women implants. Um, and by the time we came back a month later to check up on uh, how they were doing, uh, there was already 290 more women that were on the waiting list. So we, we have so many women who want these procedures and who line up um, before the sun even rises to try and, and get a spot to get these procedures, but um, it's, it's just, it's so much to do and it's, it's been, we're, we're, we're delivering them as fast as we can to the people who want them, but it's just been a, a really incredible experience for the girls who have been able to get it, and um, people in their community are able to see how it's changing their lives and how it's allowing them to go to school and take better care of their children. So that was really impactful to see. Um, I think Isabella's going to come back and talk about uh, Nuka. So, uh, we only have 10 minutes, so I'm trying, I'm trying to be quick. I would like to share one, another amazing example of uh, 
uh, a woman called Nipa felt that she didn't bosom. I think if we showcase and share inspiring stories uh, from women uh, from important areas where biodiversity is super high, uh, it will encourage other women to also be motivated and, and take on, on jobs in conservation. Nifa, she to me is a hero. She lost her husband, who was the former forest guard of this nature reserve in, in the Amazon, called Aguilarpia, the Harpy Eagle Nature Reserve. He passed away during COVID because he had a heart complication and we couldn't get access to his medication on time. So he died in the reserve and buried there. A year before his, he passed away, Nymphas' oldest son drowned in the river outside the reserve and also buried there next to Rufino. Nympha asked me to please help her to stay in the reserve. She was prepared to learn the skills that were required to do the job. We gave the training that she needed. We sent staff to make sure that she learned the birds, provided her with the equipment, and she just thrived. As an incredible example of turning adversity into something positive. She won an international operator award last year, given by the IUCN, competing in the world with hundreds of forest guards who wanted this recognition. And she got this very well-deserved honor. And any, every time that I have the opportunity to share the story about Nifa, I do, because it's just incredible. And Isabel is going to, okay, and now that's the story that I want to leave you with and I pass it to Isabella. Thank you. So I, I wanted to include this video of um, the river which uh, she, the reserve is found on, which is uh, in the Amazon basin, it's called Rio Guaviare. San Jose de Guaviare, and basically to get to the reserve, it's 12 hours in a boat like this, like where she is <laughs> paddling to be able to get there. So it's very inaccessible, and this is her with her two sons. Um, so these are some of the species again that are being saved in the different reserves. The Tapir Reserve is a reserve in the Amazon. Cottonhead, uh, the Titi Cottonhead in Mutata, and the Blue Bill Curacao in the uh, Bauhi Reserve, which is a beautiful reserve, one of the biggest reserves of frogs, which is for approximately 4,000 hectares. And this is one of the species that can be found in many different reserves. It's a spectacle bear, which is vulnerable, and which we have to have surveillance 24 hours because it is heavily hunted and poached. Our forest guards are dedicated 24 hours and stay at the reserve every day of the year to ensure the protection of these species. And my favorite, the anteater. Uh, he was the first forest guard 22 years ago 
2019, right before the pandemic hit, I was able to stay with him and his family, and he mentored me on different um, techniques of restoration and reforestation. And that this is the palm he's talking next to, and this palm was about six to seven years old, and he had planted with community a community-led initiative more than seven thousand plants. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, these are the last videos, uh, and the last one I had to be the chat for. And I wanted to thank you all for your wonderful time and for sharing this time and giving us the opportunity to talk with you. Um, any question at all, we are here to answer them. And I just wanted to leave this message with you that we've been able to change these many lives in different ways. And Thank you so much for Bart Zoo. We wait to see you in El Dorado. Please come to El Dorado and enjoy the wonderful structures that were designed by my mother, who is the engineer, who has now dedicated her engineering skills to make one of some of the best world-class ecologists. Thank you so much. Yes, and I'm, that's me. I'm the drone pilot. <laughs> I manage this reserve and another one on the Caribbean coast. Um, the, this reserve has 1,300 hectares and the other one has around 700. So, thank you so much everybody. Participating and forming corridors. 
like in Colombia, uh, the migratory birds is, is they also go to Colombia and it's very important destination. So they need habitat, the habitat loss is happening too quickly. So it, it is when the land owners get involved and looking for opportunities, uh, options to help in a different way. So it's different, it's, it's, it's a wide uh, toolbox of uh, how we can help the conservation. Thank you. Several of us here um, participated from Watch the Zoom call uh, that you did a couple of years ago. One of the things I remember you saying was about when we started with the family planning, we were hitting the church um, and that you had gotten threats. Is that gotten any better as you've gotten better known? I think uh, um, it's, it's happening very quickly with the women's movement and uh, women empowerment. This it, has never been uh, on the agenda and on the table as, as it is like before. So uh, even the women are coming, like Isabella was saying, they're asking us to help them. And it's every day easier and easier. And I think it's because the women are spreading the word and they are happy with what is happening in their lives. So there is so much that our opposition that it can be there until you don't want to confront a bunch of, bunch of women who are upset. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't want to. So they're getting more and more support and it's making our work easier. So I now Exactly. So now it's on us because, like Emily was saying, we have 290 women in one location in our waiting list saying, can you help us? And then more women in other locations. So now we are like, we better, <laughs> better get more people involved. Yeah, I was going to say, sorry. Roger, that before, we were talking about homeless children. Have they been taught
We are mainly working in rural areas. I'll say it's very different from the cities where the uh, facilities and um, accessibility. Uh, in rural areas, it's a different world, and we are actually quite a few steps before we have get to that because we are uh, talking about education and prevention. So. I don't really know how it's going to affect or positive or negative. What I know is we are so far in in what is that reality in the cities. So it is completely different. Sorry, the gentleman here had a, a question. <laughs> we just came back from Columbia on a birding adventure and we had one of our guides was a woman and she was telling us how more women are getting But we also went to another spot where they were working with the Audubon, the National Audubon Society, in conserving the lands, as you were talking about. And I was wondering if you had any work with Audubon or other groups like that. Not directly, and I am aware of that initiative, which is amazing because they are providing binoculars to the ladies, uh, guides, training, and it's fabulous. And we hope to see more of those projects and more women. I'm really, really happy to hear that you had a, a woman's a guide. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And where did you go? You tell me later. Okay. <laughs> nice. Thank you. For us, uh, a new organization, uh, getting stronger and, and getting recognized. Uh, it is incredible the contribution of, of the River Soup. For us, is being, being endorsed and validated by such an important uh, organization, the Sioux, and the, the supporters and their members. It is an honor and truly is a jump us to the next level. Uh, just being here is, is, is wonderful to be able to share this project and our projects with us. And um, the communication, the support on the projects, having people in, in the future coming that in, in directly in connect with the zoo to visit our projects, to come and stay some of the lodges, Come on, they're watching with with uh, our guides, uh, females, and all of that is, is just a catalyst for good stuff coming. And that is an answer to our prayers because we've been asking for help and more support. And then we receive a call because beautiful and wonderful Amy was doing an extremely, I don't know how she found us, but <laughs> she did. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about how um, some of maybe the women that you interact with through your family planning clinic, um, how that can sort of lead to the civic and science programs and things that you're doing as well? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question because the, the family planning is the first, the first workshop of the first approach for the women. After that, they get so enthusiastic and interest in, interested in conservation because that's the thing that we go and talk about. And when we start to connect the dots and they realize that now they can start planning their future and what they want to do, many of them decide to perhaps finish the elementary, finish the, the high education and start receiving training in guiding, in ecology, basic biology. And we want to equip them, got enough skills that they can start recognizing the flagship species and the co-dependence with, with the, the plants or, or the environment where these species need, need to, to thrive. So they are actually getting hands-on and involved, could be in the reforestation and they are identifying the species that are native and we need to do reforestation. They can start getting the seeds, for instance. Uh, 
all, uh, with, the, with a bird identification, learning the birds, getting active on that, or the frogs. So you can imagine this, you pick and choose, you have orchids, you have bromeliad, you have plants, you have trees, you have all the biodiversity. So it's, it's a, a matter of us helping them to continue their journey, but they don't need to be the, become dependent on us to continue. So if they have that interest, we, we can help them with access to information. Uh, we were talking with the zoo uh, here and the education department and the marketing department and how they can help us with initiatives that they work very well here that we can adapt and, and apply in our work. With, they are done, they're doing a great, amazing job, so we can save time and money applying and implementing those types of initiatives. And the, the, the goal is and the dream is that we have hundreds of women doing this community science from their homes or from where they are, because these habits are so important. Contributing to eBird, for instance, we're training them what is eBird, uh, I naturalist. So it's very important and valid information that is going to contribute to evaluate and assess the species because there is no way we're going to have tons of researchers or paying all these people in these remote areas. That's not sustainable. The way to be, make, make it sustainable is to have these women doing it and, and send that information to us. Thank you. They do have hope. Yeah. Yes, and it's thanks to all of you who are connecting to them and the, the supporters and the people who care because it's, it takes somebody to care and love and send that gift to them. Thank you.
the first call that she gets is from the Forest Guard calling her, the executive director, to help. Um, also, robberies, for example, one of the reserves on the edge of Venezuela was just hit with a very awful robbery when the Forest Guard was tied up and he was shot at, but he wasn't shot and he escaped through a window. And the first person he called was Sarah. <laughs> I'm scared of my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think we all do this because uh, the bigger picture. And I'm very uh, honored to work with, we are about maybe uh, 50 forest guards. And it's a large group of people. And, and they do this because they love it. And they, that they don't want to be doing anything else, which is incredible. So it shows that love and passion for nature. And if we can have more of them, and I believe that women are that force that we need to incorporate, and perhaps we don't need to be fighting or being scared of what's going to happen to them because of, of different situations. And in, in an ideal world, we will have people uh, having a different way of living uh, in the sense that they're more aware of that nature needs us. Climate change, I think everyone now has seen it one way or another. A lot of people are, are seeing the, the species that used to be there, they're not there anymore. And <coughs> it's changing. And a lot of people really don't like that change, how, how it's going. So um, if we have more women involved, I think that is a really good solution to a lot of the problems and we start incorporating different habits. So tapping into women is for me the way to go. And the sooner the better.